Well, good morning, Robert. Welcome to the show, and thanks for joining me today. Morning, Paul. How are you? I am doing super well. As we were just saying before we hit record, you got blue sunny skies. I have some rain, but you were just coming off a week of it. But uh, um, it's I'm sure it's nicer down in Birmingham, Alabama, than it is up here in Bellingham, Washington. Yeah, yeah. sunny in 56. Oh, beautiful. Well, you have quite the story to tell. Um, you run Smith & Company today, but you had uh, decades of experience with your family-run machine shop in the past. So I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience and start telling your story from the very beginning, wherever you think yeah, makes yeah. sense. Sure will, Paul. So I'm Robert Smith with Smith & Company, uh, newly uh, formed business here in Birmingham. Uh, I've been in this uh, my whole life. Uh, our company uh, here, new company, is Smith & Company. Um, we uh, got our uh, LLC agreement uh, on April 15th, 2021, which uh, okay. is, an, is an easy day to remember since it's tax day. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, we actually uh, started, uh, you know, laying out basically what we wanted to do. Uh, our original plans, uh, I'll say this before I get into my uh, uh, history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we when I left old company, um, really didn't know I was going to start another machining company. To be uh, to be quite honest, uh, we had left um, with you know 30, 40 years of experience in this industry with uh, you know sales, supply chain, um, you know lean manufacturing. I mean, basically we've seen every you know aspect of this uh, this business, and uh, as you know, it's. Uh, it can be, you know, kind of uh, tricky at times. Um, mm -hmm. So we left the company and then uh, we were kicking around what we were going to do. We considered, you know, maybe doing some consulting, uh, some consulting work because we felt like the knowledge that we had, we actually could help other industries because we, you know, we saw uh, so many times that, uh, you know, in the supply chain and the manufacturing processes, you know, sometimes people would, kind of start out on the wrong path. And then it just, you know, when it ended, it was a complete disaster. But if mm -hmm. they would have had a little direction in the right way and, and possibly the right vendors to choose from and so forth, you know, they would be successful because we saw uh, many, uh, many of those uh, applications through, through years of experience. And, uh, but during that time, I've built a lot of relationships with customers, supply chain, uh, so I have a, a pretty broad network uh, in the key, um, you know, things that's needed to manufacture parts, you know, your post-process and your, uh, your inspections, your plating, your uh, mm -hmm. penetrant tests. So there's a lot, yeah. of, uh, lot of knowledge that, you know, that I've learned throughout the years to be able to, you know, look at parts and, uh, and know who and where to go uh, for each different process. And, and sometimes those are, difficult when you're doing a new process and, uh, and you don't really have a proven supplier to do it. Uh, you're kind of, you know, gambling on, well, hopefully they don't mess up the plating because there's the last end of the, of the sure. road there and they could, they, they could totally like wipe it out. But, and, uh, you know, fortunately we didn't have a lot of those situations. So, uh, so yeah, about a week later, uh, after, uh, we were kicking around what to do, a friend of mine, um, uh, we were talking with him and he kind of wanted to go in business with us and start another machining company. So we're, uh, we're pretty uh, well funded on the backside and uh, uh -huh. we uh, wasn't what I was going to do, but it's yeah. certainly, you know, we know how to do it. So, sure. so here we are. And, uh, and uh, I'll uh, kind of go back and tell you uh, my history where I started. So um, sure. go back. Uh, I'm 54. So born in 69. So uh, my father uh, has always been machining, fabricating, welding, so forth. So he actually went to technical school out of uh, high school uh, in the mid 60s. Uh, and he's always wanted to be a machinist. His uh, my grandfather was actually a machinist in the Navy oh, uh, cool. on a uh, on a destroyer. So he uh, had worked for, at the time, it was B.F. Goodrich Tire Plant. Uh, my grandfather did, and my father went to work there as a foreman uh, at that plant. But he was always a person that, he, you know, wanted his own business. He didn't really, you know, like working for, uh, 
you know, the other person. And he had, he had big goals of starting his own machine shop. So mm-hmm. in 1974, he actually started his own machine shop. It was totally part-time. And during this time, my father was also uh, a uh, officer in the National Guard and was a mm-hmm. company commander all over Alabama. Um, so all of his spare time was spent at the machine shop, you know, taking on work and fixing it. And during that time, there was a lot of strip mining uh, in our area, okay. which he was doing a lot of, uh, you know, repairing, uh, you know, drag line buckets, big front end loaders, conveyors and so forth. Sure. And then in 1976, um, he met a guy uh, in Bessemer that had a, a ductile iron foundry and basically talked him into um, letting him value add to the castings they were making. So okay. they had a conversation, actually it turned into, we did work for them for, you know, almost 30 years. Um, basically the ductile iron castings, you know, you, you may have to drill a hole or drill and tap a hole, or maybe there's some wheels you have to bore, put some grooves. Um, so he started doing that in, in, uh, 76. And then, uh, of course me and my brothers growing up, um, dad, it was a, some large volume of, of different parts that needed some, some work done on them. So mm-hmm. we would actually uh, pick up the parts and best was just, our company was in Tuscaloosa. Um, and we would pick up the parts and best and pick them up, deliver them. But we would, we as a family would, uh, would team up. Dad would make all the hard fixtures. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of, it wasn't a lot of scrap because I mean, you had go, no go gauges, thread gauges and sure. so forth. But he would, he would make all the uh, fixtures that located all the casting. So, you know, during my childhood and all the way through high school, uh, we did a fair amount of work uh, for that foundry, but mm-hmm. my father would pay us piecework. So okay. uh, it was, you know, it was a win for him and a win for us. Uh, and yeah. so during that time, depending on, you know, when we got orders, you know, we, you know, just worked as we needed to, you know, it was, sure. you know, after school or, or on the weekends, uh, and so forth. So we grew up, you know, totally hands-on, uh, in the machining world, you know, like I say, since we were, since we were little kids, um, <laughs> and then dad, um, uh, you know, made actually pretty good money. Cause, uh, I mean, dad paid uh, us, us boys the same, um, as he did everybody else that he hired, but, um, we were a little more hand-eye coordinated and kind of, I mean, even back then I remember, you know, staging parts and making every, every second count, whether, you know, you, you pick the part up in the same place because it goes in the, it goes in the little air valve that, you know, that you're doing, right. try to try to maximize uh, your productivity through all the moves you're making. Because so you were doing the the day, lean, you were doing lean Kaizen stuff as a kid and you didn't even know it. I didn't even know it exactly right. And that's, <laughs> that's why, awesome. you know, and that's why, you know, when, I mean, in the eighties, I mean, we're doing piecework, making 20 bucks an hour where he was hiring people that couldn't make but 10 bucks an hour. And right. It, you know, we had the same, the, the, the same setup and everything, but it was just, it was all those little things that took, uh, you know, that you put in place that saved seconds. And when you're doing, I love that when you're doing, I mean, some of the little parts, uh, you know, when you're doing a thousand little pieces and you're threading a bolt, it has five, eight, eleven on there. Um, you know, if you do a thousand a day, you know, a couple of seconds adds up. Yes, and it does. Uh, I remember this is a little story and I'll move on. But when I was in the third grade, um, third grade. our shop was actually uh, walking distance uh, from where we lived. Okay. But we grew up, you know driving tractors and dad would put us in, you know, all kind of different things, something that uh, I would not do with uh, my kids today, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, he didn't, he didn't believe in, uh, he, I guess he didn't have any fear. And, uh, right. and I guess he knew his kids were you know, calculated, had a, calculated had a good risk. Yeah, exactly. And I think about some of the things that even when I was doing back then, I'm like, Oh my goodness. Uh, but one Saturday uh, I was up at the shop uh, by myself, we had a little, it was a little Chinese drill press and dad uh, rigged up micro switches to where I think we were threading a five, eight, uh, 11. So he, mm-hmm. you know, we could adjust it with a collar, with a, uh, with a bolt sticking out. So 
and we had a um, a little air um, a little air cylinder that would clamp the part. And then, of course, we were using machine oil, which was you know it was the best for what we were doing. It was just kind of real dirty. But uh, I remember that day I run a uh, thousand pieces, and uh, Dad at the time was paying me three cents a piece. And this is when I was in third grade. And I was so proud of myself that Saturday. Worked by myself, didn't get hurt. And because um, I was saving up for a 12 inch, and this is probably before your time, a black and white TV. And um, I did uh, probably a year later graduate to a color TV. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that yeah. That was as a third started, grader. That was as a third I was grader. a third grader. I'm in a, so you're you know, what, a little, nine years old? Something like that. Well, uh, yeah, Eight yeah. So I was in a, yeah, I was at the shop, a little forty by sixty building in the back of it by myself. You know, just That's amazing, just running little parts. But uh, don't let OSHA come. No, it was, it was, <laughs> right, right. It was, a, it was a great time. It was a good learning experience, and you know, we never, uh, fortunately, we never had any injuries. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the worst thing that happened years later, we got some cast iron specs because we were machining some dry stuff in our eyes, but it was never, never any, really any cuts or, yeah. you know, broken wow. fingers or anything. We just, <laughs> you know, we just worked, but that taught us a lot, yeah. um, you know, looking back, you know, seeing that. And then, you know, throughout the years up to through high school, we would get bigger orders in. So I would hire all my, uh, all my high school buddies to come over and we would, uh, we would process parts, and uh, at one time we were uh, dip e coating uh, some uh, Peterbilt muffler brackets because we did hundreds of thousands uh, of these muffler brackets at one time, and they would come in five or six thousand at a time. So um, I would just hire all my friends. We'd pay piecework, and right. you know it, it all worked out. And um, so I'd love to in, uh, I'd love to pause for a second and just focus on that that your your sort of fanatical attention to process and doing something the same exact way and probably iterating on that. Like if I pick yep. it up in my left hand and do it like this, I can cut another second out of it. Right. Yeah, um, no, totally. It's such an amazing uh, learning experience at such a young age. And it reminds me when we, when our machine shop was pretty, pretty early, we had some big production runs and my co-founder and I, we would sort of race each other on who could optimize like the change out of the machine faster. So we'd set a stopwatch and we would get down to like, you know, you open, you know, as soon as the cycles, as soon as it hit M30, before it had even retracted all the way, you know, you're opening the doors, you're opening, you know, the vice with your left hand, you already have a piece mm -hmm. of raw stock in your right hand. You can like mm -hmm. flip the old part out, put the new stock in, you know, hit, <laughs> close it down, hit it one Absolutely. time with a hammer, hit the green button, you know, in like 15 seconds. And like, just no, we worked on that and worked on that. It's so yeah. fun, quite honestly. It's it's really no, a blast. It, you know, it really is. And those <clears throat> those things are, are, you know, it's I always like a good challenge anyway. And it's like, you know, it, it, yeah, you could wait till the uh, machine stopped and then, you know, open the door and, and do your process, but you're going to lose uh, minutes and uh, mm -hmm. everything that, you know, I guess having your own business, you know, you know that every minute needs to count and, yeah. and time is money that you can't get back. You know, once sure. time is gone, you, you know, you're, you know, yeah. I, I guess you could work a lot more overtime and so forth, but I'm, uh, I've always been a firm believer in working smarter and not harder mm -hmm. and trying to figure out, figure out ways, uh, you know, to optimize processes and, and yeah. still doing that today. And, um, uh, right. So yeah, no, I can, I can totally relate, uh, to what you're saying. Cause, um, when, um, after, uh, high school went on to, to start uh, technical college and during that time we opened full time and then, um, you know, there was an oil and gas boom going on. So all we had to do was open our doors where we were at and we did all mm -hmm. kind of, uh, downhole tool work, repairing of, uh, uh, you know, re repairing trucks for like uh, Schlumberger, Halliburton, um, right. uh, all these wireline uh, trucks. They all needed little things fixed, you know, rethreading, sure. you know, fix a coupling. And so that's what we started doing as well as um, still doing the cast iron parts for the foundry. So in 1991, we had this, uh, it was a wheelbrider, uh, wheelbrider machines or 
big tumbling machine that shot blast or whatever. So the uh, the foundry made the the links. Uh, there was a left and a right link on, that kind of hooks mm -hmm. together with a bar that rolls a drum. So it was a three op part, um, and that was one of our first uh, CNC production jobs. But uh, it was three operations and did exactly what you were talking. And of course, it was a fadal. It was our first mm -hmm. uh, CNC mill, and yeah. um, really, you know, didn't have to. Um, you know, you take the door and lock off, and you can still kind of, <laughs> still kind of get in there, and you know, you sure. undo the undo the first fixture while you know you may be doing the the third fixture and and uh, okay. and so forth. So totally, totally relate to that, and that's actually how, um, you know, we would show people when we hire, and uh, mm -hmm. and you, you knew that people if they could, you know, do that kind of stuff, then uh, usually you know they could uh, they could run production quite well. So. Because uh, mm -hmm. I mean, this industry is not for everybody. But, uh, no, it's not. And some yeah. are like minded that way. They love the challenge of optimization, and others really don't. Yeah. Yeah. They're just satisfied it's, it's, with, yeah. you know, with, with whatever the first part, uh, you know, sure. runs the cycle time. And it's like, no, everything can be optimized. So, yeah. I'm totally trying to attract totally and, and trying to attract those folks and get them, get them uh, uh, encouraged uh, is the trick. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. got to do it safely as well at the same time. Yeah. So we're up to, uh, you know, I got out of college. We started opening full time in, uh, in 89. Uh, it was late 1989, 90. Um, we were still doing repair work and so forth. Uh, we did get our first uh, foot all uh, in 91, mm -hmm. which then thereafter, a few months later, we bought another one and then another one. And then we got a CNC lay a few years later. So um, we just saw <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the need for CNC machine. I mean, could some of those parts have been done, uh, you know, on a, you know, on a custom fixture with multiple drill presses or we even go way back into a, uh, in the early, uh, no mid eighties to a, a turret lathe. So oh, wow. okay. we were doing, yeah. uh, we were doing, and that's where you really save some time with their, you know, getting your sure. tools changed and so forth. But that, uh, that wasn't going to be long-term, but we got rid of that sure. and then got uh, our uh, CNC lathe, but uh, which made uh, processing parts uh, so much easier. And um, mm -hmm. so through that time, um, we then, uh, my father actually took an early buyout uh, at the uh, it was Michelin plant uh, then and mm -hmm. um, started, um, uh, we did our first expansion in 93. Uh, we added on another 50 by 100. Uh, and then we started doing some um, tire building equipment. Uh, he okay. had connections in that industry. So we were with a, um, a German company uh, where we started making all kinds of windups and actually some of it uh, went all over the world to Brazil, to Mexico, to Ohio, uh, to Georgia. Um, but uh, we did that for several years. And in the middle of our equipment building, we, um, Mercedes came. So they, uh, they came to Alabama and uh, mm -hmm. I just remember the first tour uh, that they, they were looking, they were still dirt working out of trailers uh, and the purchasing uh, people, I'm sitting like 10 of them, uh, came and visited our little uh, wow. 40 by 60 shop uh, and were looking for, you know, machine shops to help them make jigs and fixtures, you know, little paint jigs, uh, stuff, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's needed in the automotive manufacturing. Um, yeah. And so they chose us. And shortly after that, we started, you know, getting our RFQs. We started doing work for them. And then that brought on a whole nother level of uh, adding more equipment, you know, hiring uh, a lot more uh, machinists, like real seasoned machinists. At one time we had probably close to upwards of 25, uh, like real machinists. And uh, mm -hmm. like I'm talking about, I was young. So people working for a 21 year old that are 45, you know, that was a little bit challenging back then. Uh, sure. it, all, yeah. it all worked out. But um, so we did a lot of work uh, in the automotive industry and it was it was kind of neat to see that evolve to 
the 3D modeling and the cam side, because when we first started in 95 with them, they would send the whole car body to us and, uh, and say, Hey, we need a, we need a, oh, really? you know, a little jig to put this emblem on, or we need a little jig to install, um, you know, a tailpipe or whatever they needed to install because they were obviously, um, you know, using the Toyota production system. So mm-hmm. they were looking at uh, ways of optimizing their own uh, plant. Sure. And the first vehicle I remember, I mean, there, when I, because we used to go up there weekly you know, multiple times and just, you know, get work from all the process engineers and Mm-hmm. and um and so forth so it was neat to see the see the plan evolve from you know the first one was they might have had less than 20 robots in the whole factory uh, and those were the bulk of those were in the body shop and mm-hmm. uh, so the the paint uh the paint booths or the paint shop and the assembly shops were basically i mean it was all it was all manual work. I mean, everybody's like putting stuff in, screwing it. There was not a lot of assist device. There was for the windshield and so forth. So it was a couple of automation cells, but it was, uh, it was funny to see that when they say that first, you know, the first one was really hand built. It really was hand built. Uh, That's amazing. Which anytime you hand build something, you know, you need jigs, fixtures, sure. um, you know, assist device, uh, anything to make it. I mean, if they could take two seconds out of it, they would, they would, you know, buy a custom tool or, right. or little clip tools and Darren parts and Darren sleep. We just, it was thousands of different jigs and fixtures that we made over the, the course of the years. And then probably the first two or three years we were doing it with craftsmen, like you know, there's machinists mm-hmm. that are fitting this stuff, you know, cause right. we were uh, lucky to hire some tool and die guys uh, that right. lived about 50 miles away from a, from a tool and die shop, which they understood everything, which was amazing. Yeah. And uh, so it made, made our lives easier. Um, but then in the, I would probably say uh, towards the, you know, 97, 98. Okay. They started letting uh, the 3d, 3d models, uh, you know, mm-hmm. be released. Yep. So I yep. got, uh, I got a, uh, a contract engineer who's a friend of ours uh, still today uh, who helped us start modeling up our uh, jigs, fixtures, putting the, the surfaces, you know, that, that meet the body. And then suddenly, you know, we machine it and it, it, and we only had three axes. So, mm-hmm. but it just fits the body perfectly, you know, no right. more sanding and, you know, and all this stuff. Sure. So that led us into, you know, hiring our own engineer, uh, getting, uh, getting our own software and, and then start, uh, basically we started our own engineering department. Uh, we had, mm-hmm. uh, I think three, mechanical engineers uh, that helped us, you know, with the tire building equipment and then modeling up all the jigs and fixtures uh, because a lot of the parts that we did were repeat. So it would be a, you know, a a central store item or whatever they would put in stock and then they would just, you know, uh, repeat orders. And and I think some of the old companies still doing some of those exact tools today. So like 25 years later. That's Um, amazing. So then, you know, we're, we're doing this whole smorgasbord of work. So we're fabricating, we're making equipment, we're still doing production machining. So I think in late 88, 89, it was like, hold on, man, we got to put a pause button on this thing and like figure out what we're going to do going forward. So mm-hmm. obviously production machining and CNC machining was where we wanted to go because that's, you know, kind of, um, one of was a little easier to manage from a, a project standpoint, but it was it's where our roots came from, you know, you know, mm-hmm. drilling parts and processing parts and so forth. So mm-hmm. we, um, we decided then to kind of slowly kind of weed ourselves out of the equipment side of things and all of the workstations. Cause it, during the Mercedes times, I mean, it was their also their tier one suppliers that needed, you know, sub assembly workstations and, so we did right. you know, a lot of that. So sure. we started focusing on uh, production machining. So we got into, uh, uh, it was probably uh, a dozen parts or so for a, um, it was a European option uh, for that vehicle. Um, we were a tier two on those. So that got us into buying our first uh, twin spindle lathe with 12 foot bar feeder. Okay. And then that, program uh, was going on. And then in 2003, 
uh, we get some more um, production parts, uh, mm -hmm. and we got our first. Uh, it was the first. It was a pretty big order, actually. Um, we were, it, it, although it wasn't a U.S. option, it was uh, an after, uh, not really an aftermarket, but uh, European option for this hitch that snaps on underneath the bumper for whatever we were making mm -hmm. the housing for that. But it was basically a piece of three inch uh, uh, ten eighteen that uh, we bought. Uh, to truckloads from the from the mills, you know, about four or five inches long. So we had the volume to then be able to say, okay, how can we do this faster? So we put in a uh, our first robot cell. So okay. we bought an ABB robot, and we had a, uh, a DMG three axis mill that we put uh, dual rotary heads on there. Okay. Yeah. And then we also in the cell was a twin spindle uh, DMG lathe with live tooling. Uh, and then, you know, there was some uh, dot pinging for date codes and right. deeper and, and so forth. But uh, so that got us into our first uh, first robot, cell, which ran for uh, probably almost six years. Um, so was of, that was that robot taking parts out of the lathe, putting it in the mill and then doing all the mm -hmm. deburring everything itself? Or was it assisted mm -hmm. by humans? So we had uh, <clears throat> we had an engineering firm uh, help us uh, lay it out, but basically we had a, a little uh, rolling uh, slide with our guides that we would just drop the drop the material in. The robot would actually pick up the raw material, and then when it's completed, it put it out on a little conveyor, and then out come uh, all the parts on the conveyor, and then we would wow. you know, inspect them and so forth. Might have been some some light deeper work, but not much. We tried to let it all. <laughs> uh, you know, be done by automation. So, so can I ask a question? How, how did you even, as you were making this transition to production work, get the opportunities to quote that work and even to know what price you had to, you know, or needed to price it at in order to win the contract, which obviously was not at that point optimized with robotics and all those kind of things. So yeah. How do you even, where do you start that formula? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we get, you know, the companies that we were, um, you know, quoting to and, and doing work for, you know, they send, uh, we did have relationships with this German company. Um, and the German company that we were doing the previous work, uh, our first tier two work, um, mm -hmm. on the first program had this second program. So we already had some relationships. Actually, my father had met the, the owners of this company in Germany. And so there was already a little connection there uh, for us. And we found, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, you know, it's not, hey, send three bids and the lowest, you know, the lowest sure. guy gets it. I mean, there was a lot of things to consider, you know, relationships, delivery, uh, and so forth. But I mean, basically we, you know, figured out what the cycle time was and um you know cost of material mm -hmm. and so forth so that that was a little challenging i'll be honest because mm -hmm. um in an automotive contract uh there's no changing the price i mean you know they right. won't they want the prices to go down so much every year right and uh and it was good uh until uh the uh, scrap market went crazy in 2007 uh, where uh, the scrap surcharges were, uh, they were almost uh, 50 cents a pound, which that's what we were paying for our steel. So it, it's, you're always going to have scrap surcharges. And I think, uh, you know, maybe when the program started, maybe it was like 10 or 12 cents. But when, um, when the scrap surcharges almost doubled, uh, there was not much we could do. I mean, we had to, you know, just manage our way through that. And, um, so those, those were some challenging things and some hard lessons learned. But I mean, during that time, we also added, uh, we added more DMG machines. Uh, we did buy multiple, uh, we had another part um, that, uh, that we started doing. We made all of the um, tow lugs um, for the three models that they were making. Uh, and basically it was just a piece of uh, inch and eighth, uh, 12L14, which was, Mm -hmm. greatest material ever Butter to, yeah um, yeah we were doing those on the three lathes uh and bar feeders and doing some uh some zinc plating afterwards but uh, that part ran for uh, probably six and a half years um wow so there again 
uh, when you're doing thousands of parts I'm talking about optimization, it's so key. I mean, it's mm-hmm. so key how the raw material goes in. It's so key how you process chips. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's key on everything, not just machining the part, but what happens to the part when it comes out of uh, the machine, you know, where does it sure. go? Where is it placed the containers uh, <clears throat> and so forth. So that was a lot of lessons learned through the, uh, through the two thousands. Um, and then <clears throat> we bought our first, um, excuse me. We bought our first <clears throat> five axis machine. It was a DMG Mori ADU in 2007. Okay. <laughs> we had, uh, we, we had a more Seeky horizontal that we were doing some scroll compressor parts on and we wanted to optimize that. And that machine was, we had actually bought it used come out of a Fred Jones uh, rebuild uh, plant somewhere in Kentucky. We bought it, ran great for several years. It really didn't have any, any issues with it, but we saw the need for newer equipment and, you know, less process and in getting into the five axis. Now, mm-hmm. when we bought our first five axis in 2007, we didn't have any five axis work. Mm-hmm. We bought it with dual, all of our ones we bought with dual pallets. So yeah. we just knew going forward, if we wanted to be, you know, competitive, stay in the marketplace, you know, one, we had to keep up with technology. Mm-hmm. So we bought that uh, machine and we had like two jobs for it. And then for us <clears throat> transitioning from all three axis turning works. And then now we're into this um, big ADU DMG machine with two pallets, Siemens 840D controls, you know, that changed a little bit of everything. Okay. Now we got to look at our cam software, how mm-hmm. are we process. It was a totally different process. So, I guess it was probably good that we didn't have a lot of work at the time, but then <laughs> about six months later, after, um, after we got this, uh, machine, uh, we get, we get a RFQ from uh, this defense company, uh, that, uh, they needed all these, uh, parts. So like a hundred different part numbers. Wow. And a lot of them were, uh, I mean, we were looking at it cause during that time, the automotive, you know, it was trending down in seven. And uh, and some of those uh, contracts were probably fixing to end because I mean like like most automotive six or seven years your life cycle and mm-hmm. you know you got to look for something else. Uh, yeah. So we um, <laughs> we got this RFQ in just randomly. Uh, my younger brother and I, Tim, um, we were looking at it. We really didn't think anything about it. It's like who sends who sends a hundred? It was just John. Norton, we had to go get them printed because. You know, we didn't really uh, have uh, the means to, to plot all that back then. So, you know, we go get all those uh, hundreds of prints uh, because, I mean, one part could have five different prints, you know, the aerospace wow. and uh, defense yep. world. Yeah, We'd never done it. and uh, But we started looking at the parts and it was like, well, yeah, I mean, we can do this. Yes. And it's, next thing you know, it's like a couple of weeks later, uh, we had pricing on raw material uh we've got our plating uh I, luckily i had a good relationship with the plating company who was doing some of the automotive work uh, mm-hmm. which they're in uh, they're located in huntsville so they knew all the cart paint all the chem film all the you know the, right. the lusterless black so <clears throat> which was really good so got a price from them and we sent our um <clears throat> rfq in i think it was one friday morning and then about noon these two uh, seasoned buyers, uh, they're still friends of ours today. They, uh, they called us up and said, hey, uh, can we come see you Monday? And we're like, well, sure. And he's like, well, we might be a little casual. You know, we might be wearing shorts and, uh, you know, just a, a leisure top. <clears throat> so <laughs> <laughs> I love the clarification. We didn't know this from, we didn't know these guys from anywhere. And they came from uh, Massachusetts. So they, so they flew down. Us, they flew down on the weekend to see you. Among they you. did, yeah, yeah. So they come in and uh, <laughs> they were they were wearing their Florida gear. They had uh, you know Tommy Bahama shirts on and shorts, <laughs> and they were just all kind of chilled out. And these were people that these were these were two guys that were my father's age. So okay. uh, been in the industry for uh, m- many years, and uh, so they came down, talked to us, and. You were like, yeah, you know, your uh, your your parts are they're 
you know, you're in line with the, with what we need to pay on all of them. And right. um, so it was at that point we kind of got started in the, in the uh, defense, the fence world, but wow. we were like, uh, so we asked, one, we wanted to know how do they find us in Tuscaloosa, Alabama? Yeah. So it's not really a aerospace defense area. Mm-hmm. In fact, I don't think there's any. I don't mm-hmm. even know if there's, well, there probably is some now in Birmingham, but it's like, well, he says, uh, you know, uh, I called DMG Mori and the customer that we're making these for has DMGs in, in, uh, in Norway and you had it, their exact machine. He says, so I called DMG Boston and they said they recommended three shops. We were one of them. Uh, I think uh, the other two didn't even respond and we did. Wow. So I'm like, So wow, they figured you could do the same parts because you had the same machines as the, the same their, machine, the same area. exact machine. Yeah. So it's like, wow, if we wouldn't have bought that, that five axis, uh, you know, yeah. CNC, we probably wouldn't have got our name on the list to even been able to have that opportunity. It's a crazy story. So, so can I ask, can I ask what else do you think they had to see when they came down to give them the confidence to place all that work with a relatively unknown vendor? Yeah. So we had a fairly organized shop. Um, We were, we had went through another expansion in uh, uh, 97 where we um, had added on engineering offices, two floors, added on another, um, uh, 50 by 100. So we had about 20, at that time, about 22,000 square feet, roughly. Mm-hmm. So it was it was nice layout. I've, uh, I've always been kind of a real neat freak about everything and cleanliness and, you know, and things have a place and, you know, it, it goes mm-hmm. there. And that's how I've kind of trained people uh, throughout the yeah. years. It's like, you know, when you get down to the job, now your job's not complete until everything's put back up in the right spot I and love that. cleaned up. And yeah. uh, that's just what I've always done. And I'm, I just want our workers to do that and, and so forth. So <laughs> there wasn't a lot of prep work that we had to do other than, yeah, we did probably work a little bit, you know, cleaning up things. Sure. And, but they, one of the things that this company was doing, they wanted a family small business. And that, um, that is what, um, you know, basically they liked because they like to get a small business that needs work that they can grow with. And mm-hmm. it wasn't like a one time, um, you know, one time order. And then, you know, they're on to the next one. No, it's, sure. it's like when they choose a, a company, uh, to work with, you know, it's a partnership. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a partnership until somebody messes up, you know? And, uh, of course we never did. So, um, so yeah, that's how they, they, they knew us. And then of course, you know, they ended up at that time it was dual source. So we got like, mm-hmm. they split the money half and half with another shop uh, up North, uh, which then throughout the time we ended up <clears throat> um, being sole source. They actually uh, kind of weeded out the, the other shop up North, which was a beautiful uh, shop and big shop. And, um, but the ease of doing business with a small company Uh, making engineering changes on the fly. There wasn't, um, we made it easy for the customer. And that's, you know, it's been the way uh, that we were brought up, you know, customer, you know, I mean, the customer's, you know, always right. I mean, there are probably a few times when you, you know, (laughs) you know that maybe they're not, but but those are rare um, Mm -hmm. because you kind of look at everything up front going into it. So you kind of, you know, it's almost doing your, um, um, you know, your risk mitigation. It's like, what could go wrong here? I mean, we were doing right. that subconsciously back in the day, even right. with the automotive parts, you know, like what could sure. go wrong? The, this, because we put, uh, we put multi mills to supply our material because, uh, you know, we put means in place just because we didn't ever want to have a problem. Sure. So and we've wow. kind of, kind of, uh, you know, uh, done that going forward, but, but yeah, so, over time, our, our price delivery and, uh, and customer service actually got us, uh, got us all the work actually. Wow. So that making it easy, is that just being super responsive, having a can do attitude, making sure you follow through on your commitments, 
Like no, what else goes into yeah. making it easy? Well, um, we've always had great relationships uh, with our customers. And I mean, they're friends of the family, I mean, basically, because mm-hmm. um, I mean, there, there are, we all have had customers, you know, that's transactional that, you know, it's kind of, yeah. you know, bigger companies, you know, you get a new buyer every two or three years. So there's not really, but your sure. large customers that, that we had, those, um, those relationships go very deep. I mean, because mm-hmm. I mean, one, we want them to go deep, uh, just for the uh, sheer fact of, uh, how much financial, uh, investment that we put into, you know, making their parts and growing with them. So it was yeah. always, a it was always, a, uh, you know, a great relationship, but, you know, when, um, you know, when they call, it's like we give answers. It's not, you know, they're talking to the owners of the business. They're not talking to, mm-hmm. you know, the supply chain person or the sales or, well, sales or, I mean, we're talking about all those, but we all wore those same hats. So, sure. uh, but as we grew, we added on some more staff, but it was like, no, if the customer calls, we're the one, to, we're the one to talk to, we're the one that'll, that'll communicate with them because, you know, not everybody not everybody has that, I don't know how to say it, has that ability to, sometimes you got to like understand what the customer's asking because they're, you know, they may not be asking it in the right way, but you kind of know what they mean. They might turn around to something, but you need to come back with, you know, things they want to hear, but not really just telling people what they want to hear, but actually knowing, knowing in your gut that you can actually deliver. Yeah, and sure. that's, we were really uh, tight knit on, you know, who the customer, you know, speaks with and so forth mm-hmm. uh, in that business. And, you know, that business was, you know, uh, you know, probably uh, close to 30 million, you know, and um, at we, that time uh, or uh, well, at that time it was, uh, it was probably close to about 12 million. Wow. And okay. we had yeah. uh, in 2007, we had probably 50 50 people maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so yeah, so customer, <clears throat> dealing with the customers is, is so key. I mean, customer service, yeah. I mean, people can manufacturing, machining, there's thousands of great shops out there, thousands. And not everybody can specialize and do it, you know, for, you know, the same price as us or vice versa. So, but I think relationships are so key. Uh, so key and people always tell people, I'm like, uh, they don't, people don't buy from companies. They buy from people. Yeah. And I think that's so, so important. And, you know, when you get, when you get those relationships, you can have some conversations. If, if it needs to be a hard conversation, you have that hard conversation. It's not, um, fortunately for whatever reason, we never really had to have a lot of hard conversations that I recall in the last uh, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we always uh, did what we said we were going to do, delivered when we, you know, said we would and so forth. And, and we were always growing up, uh, I guess we all had the entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, you know, when you look somebody in the eye and you tell them, look, I'm going to deliver this part, you know, Friday at five. Well, by golly, you do it. You try to do it earlier, mm-hmm. but you know, if you're looking, you know, early in the week and you know, you see you know, that you've got to work 24 hours a day. Well, that's what we do. And there's, Mm -hmm. you know, I grew up working, you know, seven days a week, you know, 16, 18 hours a day. It was just kind of a norm when you've committed to the customer. Now that wasn't, um, you know, it, it happened a lot when you're small and, uh, Mm -hmm. but yeah, just going, doing the extra effort, uh, for your customers is so key because I mean, customers, And I think now it's changed. The market's changed a lot where customers have so many options. Now there's so many good shops out there and so many people that, uh, that can service them. And so I think it's a little market's a little tight right now, but, uh, at the end of the day, it it is uh, totally about customers. So there must've been times where something completely out of your control happens and there's, there's no way that you can work, you know, 30 hours in a day and make up the time. And in those situations, were you just really proactive with your communication and just Mm -hmm. candid and try to troubleshoot together? What can we do to, you know, resolve this? Yeah, that happened. uh, 
that happened a couple of times. Um, mm -hmm. It, you know, during the nineties, there's automotive is like, you know, hurry up, wait, you know, everything's got to be now, 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 now. And there were times when we, we uh, were doing repair work after hours work and they may have a whole line down waiting on this shaft or waiting on this crazy part. And there were times when uh, we did work 24 hours a day for multiple days straight we had two shifts, so it was mm -hmm. a little easier to, to get people working. But there were times when I did have to call the customer and say, hey, look, you know, we got a problem. Right. And there were people that accepted it. And then there were people that didn't accept it. I remember a couple sure. of people that just went off the went off the deep end. And I'm like, but what was so <clears throat> I knew that we've did exhausted every resource known to man to get mm -hmm. this you know, project done. And it just did not happen in the time frame they wanted to. So I sure. had to have a couple you know, conversations like that. But most of the time, if you tell the customers early, mm -hmm. you know, and let them know that, Hey, look, uh, you know, we're a couple of days out on this, but uh, you know, I think we might have right. a problem. And yeah. I think letting them know that is so key. And, Absolutely. Uh, because it, it, it gives them it. time to maybe back up and punt and for them to, you know, because, Everybody at those uh, companies, I mean, they're answering to other people and, you know, they have to go back to their superiors and tell them, mm -hmm. the, you know, the situation. So and I know, you know, it's difficult for those people to to be put in that situation. But we never had those conversations unless it was an absolute must. And we could mm -hmm. we could look them in the eye and say, I promise you, we've done everything uh, humanly possible to to, you know, get your part done. It's just we've mm -hmm. had, you know, this, this and sure. this. Um, so. Yes. Communication is very key. That's a great lesson. Yeah. Um, I wrote a blog uh, about a year or two ago about, you know, sharing bad news. You got to do it early and with as much information as possible about what you've tried and, totally and what are the, what are the resources? What are the questions <laughs> to, and oftentimes, like you said, you know, they want to have a successful outcome. So like, okay, well, if you can get us a partial here or there, or if we do this or make this other concession, then oftentimes that actually helps build this, the strength of the relationship. Even you can work together yeah, yeah. through those, some of those things. And no, it's a rare that. occurrence, you know? Yeah, no, it totally is. I mean, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think customers appreciate it. Uh, they would, uh, they appreciate you, you know, identifying there's a problem because I've heard so many times where, you know, I guess every industry experiences this, but it's like, Hey, the parts do, you know, they're looking, uh, where's the part. And, you know, suddenly they get, Oh, it's three weeks out. And it's like, yeah, it's like, you didn't know that two weeks ago. And, uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, you hear horror stories, uh, of that and, uh, we try to avoid that at, at all costs. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, and two, in those critical projects, I mean, you're, we get intimate, intimately involved in the whole process. So, you know, we're not newbies at this. So it's like, we can, you know, see a little bit forward and say, yep. there's no way. I mean, there's a hundred hours of machining and the, you know, the things do in two days and that's 48 hours. So, you know, you better be, you know, having that conversation now versus later. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, but those are some, those are some, uh, you know, things that, things that you just, uh, you know, learn, uh, in this industry, in any industry, you know, with experience, because they don't really teach that stuff to you in, in college. No, they sure don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. okay, so you're you're running a pretty big shop, doing a fair bit of revenue. Um, what are kind of the next next things that happened? Yeah, so in 2008, we we doubled in size. We uh, we went uh, had a meeting and uh, with the customer, they needed to double our production, which was hundreds of parts. So. Uh, I remember meeting with them uh, July of 2008, and um, it was a couple of days before 4th of July. We came back. Uh, well, actually, we were at the airport, me and my younger brother, and we looked the customer in the eye and says, yes, we can we can ramp up and do your uh, double the volume by, I, I think it was four or five months. So we went back to the hotel that night before we catch the 5 o'clock uh, flight the next morning. I probably stayed in the hotel bar at about two on a napkin, you know, laying out a shop, figuring out, you know, what kind of capital we kind of knew what machines cost. And we were kind of, mm -hmm. kind of just sketched it out and said, yeah, we need about, you know, we need about three and a half million and, you know, we need to get going. So we did, we, uh, we came back 
and I uh, actually started the Monday after 4th of July. Um, I actually knew the realtor that owned the company that we bought. The building had been sitting for uh, probably about 10, well, probably about eight years. Uh, but the the tenant who was in Texas uh, had just been paying lease because they had a 15 year lease. So uh, I told uh, I told our realtor who I'd actually known my actually mother had taken classes uh, from him in college back way back. And I told uh, I told Brent, I'm like, yep, we're going to take the building. And uh, we signed a little deal. And before we could get in the building, because actually uh, we had the keys and all that. So before we even uh, swapped any money or even had uh, occupancy, right of occupancy, uh, we started uh, getting the building and, and making slabs for all the machines and, and doing everything. And I just remember the realtor coming out, uh, I think the week later and come in and, you know, half the buildings tore up. And I just remember the look on his face and, uh, and I'm like, Oh no, it's going to be fine. We're, we're, we're going to get you the money. <laughs> and, uh, so we actually started <laughs> on the building before we even owned it. Uh, that's how confident we were that the things was going to happen. So we actually wow. ended up deploying uh, that whole operation. It was another like 20,000 square foot building um, with 12 uh, DMG machines we put in. We had to change the, uh, the 40 power. We had to change the HVAC, put in quality labs, you know, slabs under all the CMMs and, and assembly rooms. So we had to revamp the whole thing. But we did that in 90 days. So incredible. it was kind of incredible. Yeah, we started power, we started commissioning machines in September uh, of uh, Caterpillar generators 480 because we mm -hmm. hooked it up to our bus bar and uh, it was before the power company even could change out our transformer. So, wow, um, that's yeah, resourceful. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was it was good. So, you know, during that, that was eight and then 10. And then we got, like I said, into a lot of other defense and aerospace companies. And, you know, we were making uh, that uh, system for years. Um, and, and there was different models that it evolved in and different you know, variations, colors and, and so forth. So in 15, we sold the company uh, in August of 2015 to private equity. Uh, like I was telling you earlier, parents uh, were aging. So it was a good decision. And so uh, myself, my older brother, Dale, and younger brother, Tim, we continued to work there. Uh, we had two year, uh, you know, agreements and so forth, mm -hmm. but um, we just kind of kept working there. Uh, Dale was doing all of, um, he handled uh, at that time, all the IT, the quality, the uh, maintenance side of things. And, uh, and he was so key to our uptime because we actually monitor that uh, on scorecards and we were like 98% uptime on all the machines that we had. Uh, That's amazing. He actually, I, I could actually count on maybe one and a half hands how many times we actually had to call the uh, the OEM in to fix machines. I mean, obviously we would so until the warranty DMGs ran were, out. Those DMGs yeah. were solid for you. They're a great machine. I mean, they're they're a great great company. And but Dale actually kept them going. So he mm -hmm. he he knew electronics and hydraulics and mechanical was his you know, right. specialty and our uptime was, was kind of incredible. Um, so yeah, we kept working for them. And then, you know, I was doing the sales estimating supply chain. I had multiple hats there and it was real easy when you're, you know, you know what to do every day. And, and that's when it was like, you know, it's just, uh, it's just kind of, it's just kind of time to move on and do something different. So right. that brings us to April of, uh, of 21 when, uh, I mean, obviously, left in a very good spot. It's a great company, friends with everybody down there. There was nothing, there was no straw that broke the camel's back or anything. It was just, you know, it was just time to, to do something different because, uh, it, it, I guess at that time, 51 or two, uh, you know, there is a, my time's, uh, passing by relatively fast. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm going to do something, I need to, <laughs> I need to get busy. So that's when, uh, that's when we started the shop. And, um, you know, it was so nice for us because me growing up in the industry, my brother, Dale, who actually joined our previous company in 2000, uh, we hired him from Mercedes Benz in 2007. So he never really worked. He was through a youngster. He grew up machining parts and so forth. And, but he was in the, um, um, 
um, managing engineering on the um, facilities at Mercedes for like 13 years. Mm -hmm. So he knew a lot about best practices and, you know, air, and air compressors and, you know, HVACs right. and lighting and, and how to, you know, basically buy, you know, efficient, uh, efficient stuff and so forth. So he came on board uh, then and worked with us, uh, and, you know, basically until we left. So uh, my younger brother, Tim, uh, he's still working for the company. And, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I guess we took all of our life lessons and basically we started with a blank sheet of paper here. Uh, we didn't even have mm -hmm. a building, went out, found a building, you know, we knew what kind of facility uh, that we wanted uh, to have and the processes that, you know, we wanted to put in place because, you know, we've experienced, you know, 30, 40 years, you experience a lot of different, different things. Yeah. Um, so we started, uh, we started, we got the building, uh, June, and then it took us about six months of 21. We got all the first three, um, machines in, uh, in December. Uh, and then we've really only been in business since, uh, January of, uh, 22. So, okay. but we knew we went with Hermla. So one of the first things oh, that wow. we, Interesting. that we wanted to identify was, you know, our technology partners. Um, yep. we kind of went, you know, something totally different and colors and everything is just a little different because we knew there was faster, better, more efficient ways to machine parts. And uh, we knew five axis. I mean, do, do we need a five axis on every job we do? No, but can we make a part in one op? Yes. Yeah, so for sure. we knew we've been looking at Hermos for several years. I mean, we all go to the MTS shows and, Mm -hmm. You know, we, uh, um, you know, you just keep up with, with, uh, with all the right people. Yeah. And then we also knew that we wanted to uh, 3d print. So we wanted to be in the additive side of things. Metal so additive. we, uh, we actually have a metal printer uh, with Mark Forge. So we went with the yeah. Mark Forge platform. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the metal X and the X seven. Uh, so those were our two biggies uh, that we decided to go with. So we bought the printers. Uh, we got our, partnered with Hermla and uh, there's some great relationships uh, that we've established with those companies. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's like we explained to them. It's kind of like the customer explained to us in the Bahama shorts or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like once we decide and, and, you know, you go with a company, you stay with them. So mm -hmm. obviously if we ever buy milling, you know, five axis milling and, and production milling and so forth, it's going to be with Hermla because that's the platform that we're using. So sure. uh, we ended up deciding on Hermla with Heidenheim. Yep. Uh, although we were, you know, Siemens 840D shop, it was just, we felt we, we saw some advantages for a smaller company that, uh, you know, the Heidenheim had to offer versus the, uh, the Siemens. So, and then we, you know, picked Michitoya uh, for our CMM. Um, which was a very good decision because um, the um, our engineer uh, actually, so back up one step. So formed the company was myself, my better half, Sherry, uh, and Dale, my older brother, and his mm -hmm. son was a mechanical engineer. He graduated from the UA in, oh, nice. uh, in 2020, right in the middle of COVID. But he, mm -hmm. He'd actually worked part time in our machine shop for growing up for years, and right. he ended up helping Dale's the last few years, uh, you know, during school and so forth. But um, he uh, he graduated mechanical engineering. You know, you know, solid works great. You know, three D modeling and so forth. Yep. But yep. I mean, he dabbled a little bit with three D printing uh, at the University of Alabama, but um, not a whole lot. And then so he became our. Um, well, he's our 3D printing guy, and he's also our uh, Mitch Toy. He never operated or programmed a CMM ever, mm -hmm. and he, their platform that they have is is very user friendly in making parts and so forth. So, mm -hmm. we uh, went with Mitch Toy. That's been a that's yep. been a good thing. And then the Hoffman Group, uh, we went with for his uh, tools cabinets, um, you know, shadowing of our tool layouts. Um, and then Lang is a big is a big partner of ours. Mm -hmm. All of our mm -hmm. machines have the Lang plates with the with the uh, with the uh, risers. We do have Garant vices on top, 
uh, of the Lang, but it's a very good combination uh, on uh, how they're able to hold parts. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the uh, the uh, Kaser uh, compressor, so uh, with the okay, smart pocket, yeah. I think that's that's super key. And then obviously coolant, uh, we went with the Blazer, and mm -hmm. then we're on Siemens NX, and then we do have a Cedar Master Cam and some SolidWorks. So we right. kind of picked out all of our you know technology partners. Sure. And which we had known and, you know, we kind of knew we were going to go that way. But I mean, there were some that once we really got serious and had to go in and, and, and see, you know, why we were going to make that choice, it was very obvious. And mm -hmm. so there's there hasn't been a, you know, in my opinion, there hasn't been a bad, bad pick yet. They're all great to work with, great products. Uh, they perform well. Um, but going back to why we went with five axis. Um, we, um, you know, wanted to do five axis cause obviously we, we saw it at our old company, you know, the benefits of having those extra access to do the parts, uh, mm -hmm. it just streamlines everything. Uh, yep. and you know, we couldn't really operate, uh, without a five axis today because I mean, yeah, there's some parts that could be done in two ops on a three axis all day long, but we're doing them in one op. Uh, where it takes less uh, less manpower uh, mm -hmm. to manufacture the parts, letting the uh, technology and all of the the great things that these machines come with, we've actually utilized all that like step one. Like for us to process a part, it probably does take us a little bit longer. But the engineer that uh, that that joined us, um, actually, I've, I've known him since probably 2007. He came down from Michigan, but he. Uh, looks at the parts, everything's processed, the tools picked out, you know, so forth. So everything, once we deploy a part, is ready to go. Mm -hmm. And, but one of the things that we do, or that we put in place too, is finding the right tooling. So, um, you know, it's it's having the right holders. It's having the, the we use Heimer holders, we use Garant holders, but the work, uh, the work uh, clamping and the tool holders and having the right tools you know, we've eliminated, you know, when we go to run off a part, I mean, there's, and I'm not kidding here, there's there's a lot of parts, some very complex parts that we've met, we don't even scrap them. I mean, the first part off is like all green on the CMM. And it's right. like, oh, wow, it's something kind of, kind of different in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying all parts are successful like sure. that, but it's not like we, you know, you know, if we do a run of a hundred, you know, maybe we scrap two for maybe a broke tap, right. whatever. But, um, I think having that stable process up front is so key mm -hmm. and us knowing what we know, we've kind of put uh, the best things in place that we've learned throughout the years, uh, you know, up front. And it just makes for a better, you know, it makes for a better uh, product. It's, it's easier to manage because, I mean, we have one machine with 12 pallets. I mean, we do lights out machining. Um, we do, um, uh, all the other machines. Uh, I mean, basically, we do have five Hermless. We bought two more uh, about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one person can run all five. Sure. Yeah. And I'm not kidding. I mean, we do run a second shift here too. But I mean, depending on now, if there's, you know, it's it's fortunate that our cycle times are about 60 minutes. So there's mm -hmm. plenty of time. But if we were doing short runs with, you know, 20 minutes, it would kind of, that wouldn't be the case, but you know, typical, typical machining cycles are 45, 60 minutes. And then when you couple it on a 12 pallet machine, I mean, you can just run like, like, you know, hours, like 16, 17 hours straight. And as long as you sure. get the chip popper, uh, you know, emptied, of course. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, when we started this, uh, you know, it was about finding the right team. People are so key. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're like, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not about me. It's not about, you know, I know everything. No, it's about collectively having a good solid team that helps you, you know, make the right decisions that helps you right. process the parts better. And, uh, and I think that's, that's been, you know, January be two years. I mean, we started January 22, zero customers, zero orders and mm -hmm. like nothing like came in after new year's and just started calling people and, you know, it's trying to get work. And uh, so that was kind of, it was wrong. I was going to ask, did you leverage 
uh, you know, your old relationships or did you have non-competes with your old company or how did that all work? Yeah, that was a little tricky. So a little bit, I mean, they've, they've for sure, uh, you know, expired a long time ago now, but, um, at first I did and, uh, and got a little bit, got a little bit, but we picked up some totally, um, totally different customers in the medical equipment side of things, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. has been, uh, is actually a blessing, uh, that, uh, that happened because, <clears throat> there were so many different parts and there were such long cycle times. It gave us an opportunity to, you know, somewhat do a stress test on our, um, our process. Mm -hmm. And it, it was like, it enabled us to prove, you know, running multiple machines, you know, and seeing, you know, how we had to, I mean, there's times when we had to, you know, adjust all the coolant nozzles, you know, it's things would mm -hmm. get clogged up. There's all those little things that you have to like refine, and when you're making hundreds of thousands of parts, you could totally do that. But if you're, you know, doing small runs, it's kind of hard to get there. So mm -hmm. we did have, that was our first, uh, largest, uh, largest order and still a great customer today, which we're, you know, run a lot of parts for them. Um, but it's been good to kind of, kind of see that process work because we're able to, to utilize all the probing in the machine, uh, all the tool setting in the machine, our tool lives, all of that. Uh, we're doing up front right. and it's making, I mean, we've implemented, uh, you know, tool vending machines, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of our repeat tools. I mean, it's, it's virtually super easy now because we just mm -hmm. uh, order every other day and, you know, next day all the tools show up, we just, you know, restock and, and right. that's been, uh, that's been uh, big because all of our production uh, stuff and some of our MRO stuff, safety glasses, earplugs, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, solvents we put in we put in the vending machine and let it manage it so it's so that was that was actually huge so how have you gone from sort of a clean slate to you know having these nice production uh customers with good volumes in such a short period of time you know there's a lot of shops out there that are kind of stuck in the job shop world they want to win more production work get that sort of bread and butter you know, spindle hours. Um, but a lot of them have a hard time doing that. How, how did, how did you, you know, land these customers so quickly? Hmm. Well, so I had a manufacturing rep that saw a, um, Birmingham business journal ad on us and I, mm -hmm. we'd known him like, um, back in the late, uh, well, no, it's probably mid two thousands. And he looked up, he's like, Oh my gosh, Smith, Smith go. I know them. I'm going to stop by and see him. So, he came by in March of uh, 22 mm -hmm. and then we signed up, you know, our, all our little stuff or whatever. And um, he was actually instrumental in finding us the medical production work, uh, okay. which was uh, so key. But that that just happened to, to he came across that like six months later. So oh, right. it was just like, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, everybody, you know, has sales reps or so forth. I mean, really don't have anything to lose. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the percentage is, it's like, you know, that's just part of the, uh, part of the, uh, peace price. Right. So he was instrumental in finding that, uh, we've, uh, some, uh, other <clears throat> contacts and now word of mouth is getting out about us. And mm -hmm. it took us a little bit of time cause we really, <clears throat> we, um, we knew we had to get ISO 9001 certified. Um, mm -hmm. that was like, so key. I mean, we can't just be a shop that has no certification. So. Yeah. Um, so we, we started that process in January of 22. We got our right cert, right. I think, uh, in July. So, but yeah. in order to get a cert, you needed product flow. You needed sure. jobs to process. You needed something to do. Yeah. So that's why it took a little bit longer uh, than we wanted, but we did end up getting our ISO in which I had already talked to a lot of customers and even some old, old people that I knew. I mean, step one is you got to have the cert. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, some were actually in the AS9100, but yep. the ISO uh, for what we were quoting on would totally suffice. So we got that and we got, uh, you know, ITAR. Mm -hmm. um, we're an ITAR certi certified. Uh, we got our FFL. Uh, okay. We can manufacture, you know, ordnance parts if needed. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of those things that we had to, to get there. Yeah, and uh, we, mm -hmm. about last summer is when uh, all those things started started coming into place, and that's really when we were able to call on the right customers. Mm -hmm. You know, because right. I mean, we talked to so many people. It's like, no, I can, for me to even do a, um, 
you know, uh, supplier quality audit, it's like step one has got to have a cert or there has to be a real good reason why, why right. they're using us with no cert. So, right. um, yeah. so we just didn't even bother with that till we got the cert. So, uh, right. yeah, that took, uh, that took a little while, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, um, I'd still get, uh, parts that are, you know, five pieces, two pieces. Not mm -hmm. that we don't quote on them, uh, mm -hmm. us being so lean and I say lean with people, um, you know, when you do complex parts, small runs, it ties up a lot of engineering, machine personnel mm -hmm. and so forth. So for, a, we're not there yet, but we'll get there, uh, you know, when we add more, uh, you know, engineers and programmers and so forth, somebody that can like project manage it, you know, basically start mm -hmm. to finish. Uh, so that's why we've kind of, we've been really lucky and fortunate, uh, you know, I mean, count our blessings that we've have had, um, you know, our parts with, uh, higher quantities, which has been nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of that. So, just was luck. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it sounds like there's some, you know, your network, right time, right place, uh, whatever kind of coming together. But I imagine as well that when those potential customers are assessing you, they're looking at your systems they're looking at your standardization and i you know i don't know what your shop looks like i imagine it's pretty beautiful um mm -hmm. but uh Perfect. you think <laughs> you think uh that plays a part in them feeling confident that you are a supplier they want to work with yeah i think so if we could you know we built this place um for i mean I'll, i won't say like a showroom but i guess it kind of is but it's how i envision all manufacturing facilities to be you know, your uh, it, everything is uh, white light, white walls, polished floors. You know, uh, LED lights. <clears throat> you know, we took mm -hmm. all that in consideration. You know, when we were uh, building this place, and because uh, mm -hmm. it's like um, one, we wanted to make it uh, great for employees to come here. You know, it's like yep. no one wants sure. to come to a dark, dingy. I mean, the machining world has a. <laughs> I mean, it gets a bad rap. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, everybody thinks machine shops, uh, dark, dirty. I mean, we could wear white shirts every day and operate equipment and go home and nothing. Right. And um, so we put that in place in our facility and, and we're, we've got room for one more um, uh, five axis at the moment. And, but we built our facility process to where it's scalable. So everything mm -hmm. is scalable. So we want to grow with customers. And, uh, you know, if we get a big customer that needs five more machines, well, uh, okay, well, we've got our eyes on uh, other buildings uh, near us. And it's like, okay, we know exactly mm -hmm. what to do. We know, yep. we know uh, what systems we're using, what machines, what tooling, gauges, all of that is done. And we did a really good job of documenting that uh, up front. Mm -hmm. And so us to scale, if say a customer wanted to put $5 million worth of business, Okay, well, that's, you know, we could probably calculate that out in a little bit and say, yeah, we need, uh, you know, this many people and this many machines, and here's how we're going to do it. And uh, so that's, that's our philosophy going forward, uh, is, uh, is growing with, with customers and obviously gaining customers, because we're, I probably could have added several more uh, customers to our list, but it just wasn't right. It wasn't a good fit, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we sure. want long-term customers that we can, like you said it earlier, is be a partner, you know. And that's that's yeah. how we look at our business and how um, how we want to grow is adding more partners. Mm -hmm. That that kind of sounds like it harkens back to when you had the chance to double uh, your old shop and you kind of knew your plan, you executed it, you brought in the same brand of machines, you you know, mm -hmm. uh, yep, exactly. that's, that's exactly. like your MO at this point. And I love yeah. that's that, that comes to, uh, something that actually I've been kind of talking about for years is like, sort of like a franchise model, you know, mm -hmm. where you did it within your own shop, but like your first few machines, you decided on everything, documented it. It's the same way to replicate that is relatively easy. You just pull yeah. out the formula yeah. and you just execute on it. There's not a lot of, yeah back and forth decision making to be done right you just know what it takes no yeah no we started with uh uh branding i mean obviously mm -hmm. uh, we did our own logo we mm -hmm. do our own website you know we, everything you see out there 
you know, there's no firm or no one really helping us uh, do those, uh, mm. do those things. Uh, we, we did it ourselves, but we wanted to start right out of the gate with logo, brand, colors, team wear, you know, facilities, even, even uh, all of our offices have the same uh, staplers. I mean, the same mm-hmm. bins, everything's the same. So uh, right. all the same colors. So we, we had all that figured out up front and we're pretty well, I mean, we're, probably branded like, you know, some companies that are 10 years old. I mean, from pads to pens to, 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 you know, we put our logos on the machines. We even had our forklift painted uh, the same colors. <laughs> all, of our, all of our stuff kind of flows and that's how we want to keep it, you know, cause when a customer yeah. comes, they're going to look and say, Oh, okay. Yeah. This is uh, this is pretty nice. And it's not just about looking nice. It's about, you know, being able to, to uh, deliver, you know, quality parts, you know, uh, to the customers. So, yeah. but if, if people come in and say, well, they're, they're getting pretty good housekeeping here and they, you know, they, you know, to me, it just stands for a lot of how you operate your, your business, your life, et cetera. Yeah. And if you come into a messy stuff, it's cluttered, there's stuff everywhere. There's stacks of drills everywhere. It's like, kind of like, oh, I don't know. Um, yeah. Kind yeah. of need some organization going on here and those things, um, you know, I've been doing it for years and, um, and it was, it was fortunate that, uh, that Sherry with us, you know, she, she is a, uh, actually she's a, um, uh, master, um, uh, fine jewelry, jewelry, uh, maker. She graduated from IU and uh-huh. so she kind of knows the metals industries, but she's also fantastic at designing and she designed all of our offices and you could go to our website and, and see. Our I'm facilities. looking at it right now. It is really incredible everyone needs yeah. to check it out it's smith.al.com that's correct right yeah yeah, yeah. And we kind of keep try to keep it updated uh you know with some new pictures and so forth or if there's anything going and then yeah we'll uh we'll do some linkedin posts i think linkedin is really good I, i'm kind of spearheading the smith and company uh more posting for the company on my personal site yeah. Um, and then we have an Instagram page that we do fun stuff with, you know, uh, but you know, the business side of things is probably more on LinkedIn. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. No, it's, uh, wow. this industry is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very rewarding, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. very, uh, you know, when you can take a block of material and make a beautiful part. And, uh, I just think it's, it's so fascinating. And so many people that's never been in machine shops that, that have uh, visited us, they're just like, woof, didn't have, you know, any idea. Uh, right. And when in reality, everything, everything that's made at some point is gone through, <laughs> is gone through a tool and die shop, a machining that's, company of uh, some sort. And 100%. people just don't understand that. And uh, so, yeah. That's been the drum I've been beating with my thank a machinist hashtag for oh, the yeah, last no, year totally. or so. No, it really it's, is. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen several of them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's Tony, like you get Tony on Guns air. take Tony Guns <laughs> taking the taking that run with it, making all his fun videos. So, yeah, um, yeah. Well, this uh, Robert has been. You're an incredible storyteller. First of all, uh, thank you for sharing all of that. You know, I often sort of wrap up the, you know, asking what would you recommend, you know, shops be doing today, um, but it so. I'll go ahead and ask the question. I imagine though, people already know, it's like you've built this playbook that is so, you've done such a good job of describing it in sort of crystal clear uh, language that, you know, the the focus on standardization, the focus on excellence, the focus on just relentless customer service, um, making it easy to do business with, with you uh, is clearly a formula that works. So anything else you would add to that, that you would suggest that shops be focusing on? No, I just think, um, you know, obviously there's so much out there on the internet with, with LinkedIn, with YouTube, with, with podcasts, like, like this one here, that people, if they just stop, listen and, you know, whatever their situation is, maybe they're fixing to add a facility. Cause I know you've had lots of people that have added facilities mm-hmm. and beautiful facilities. And it's like, there's no need for them to go out and figure out everything on their own. Mm-hmm. Just kind of look from uh, others who've done that. Cause there's no need yeah. to reinvent the wheel. It's out there. If people will Absolutely. actually, um, you know, pay attention and, and stop 
and take the time to to plan accordingly. And and I think mm-hmm. in this industry, everybody, <clears throat> like most small shops, I mean, everybody's go 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 go. I mean, they're working 12, 14 hours a day. They're you know they're they're you know all wearing multiple hats and so forth. And and I think you know that's why when we started this, it, it came a little easier because we been down so many roads and we've had so many lessons learned and we kind of knew exactly where we wanted to go. Uh, we've had, we've had, uh, a lot of people that's, uh, that customers and, uh, even people looking at, uh, you know, DMG machines or, um, or, um, uh, 3d printers come through our shops. We're totally open. You know, mm-hmm. we don't have, I mean, if, if we want to share our best practices, we have no problem sharing that because, I mean, this is a, it is a, a, a niche network that we should all share thoughts and ideas on, on because just because I've been doing it for four, I don't know everything. And there's other people out there that could, that could show me something and show me something mm-hmm. better that's faster. And those are the kind of things that you need to keep an open mind to and, and adapt the new ideas, adapt the, uh, the, the new technology that's out there, use it. And Mm -hmm. I think some of those, um, some of those things have to be top down, so to speak, you know, the the, the owners or the the managers have to adapt a new way of manufacturing and, and looking at it in a different way. And at the end of the day, um, they're going to be better off. Uh, They're Mm -hmm. going to have, you know, a little bit of less stress. The parts are going to be more consistent when you, when you do everything, you know, as, as best as you can, um, everybody, uh, wins. I'm talking mm-hmm. about the workers that are, they may have to, maybe they're not having to work weekends. They're having to yeah. spend time with their families. There's so many things. If people you utilize the technology that's out there. And one thing that we do with 3d printing, and I'm going to say this, and, uh, mm-hmm. we make all yeah. of our, uh, CMM fixtures on, nice. uh, on our, yep. our port. So every part that we check on the CMM has a dedicated fixture. It locates the same. It's quick change on the grid. It's like we don't really have a quality department because our mm-hmm. in-process inspection is the machinist, and they're doing the they're doing the uh, CMM right there. Awesome. So uh, it's really it, it's really good, um, you know, to do that. And that's one thing that we had set out to do is we want to be lean. We don't want to mm-hmm. have departments, and because I mean we've been there. They're great. Like some companies can't avoid them as you get big, but it's like we wanted to, you got management and you got the workers and mm-hmm. uh, the machinists and so forth. So we didn't want to, you know, try to go mudding up the water so early that, mm-hmm. uh, that there's communication breakdowns and getting things processed with, you know, having meetings after meetings. And we kind of streamlined that whole process Yeah, and, uh, which, uh, you know, makes for a very, uh, you know, enjoyable you know business career and uh, mm-hmm. and i think uh, i think the workers you know like that and if management can put the right things in place they got a better uh, workforce they got a happy yep. workforce like, because those are the people making the parts you know sure, they're the absolutely. ones that's you know no matter what comes uh, out of engineering they're the ones that are having to you know tweak things in and so forth but if you can standardize and eliminate as much known problems up front, it's going to work out in the end. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. and like I, you know, I tell people coming through here, it's like, you know, if you think about something, when they, you know, leave, I say, like, just call me. Here's my, my cell numbers on my business card. Just call me and ask me. I can right. give you my opinion. It's free. <laughs> sure. So. Oh, um, yeah. Everything you're saying just resonates so much about the importance of sharing and collaborating and sort of the, yeah. the concept of rising tide lifts all boats and focusing on employees um, and standardization, <clears throat> you know, yeah. and, and I know obviously uh, <clears throat> after selling the first company, you're in a, you know, a nice spot to be really well funded and not every shop has that luxury or new startup, but I think the principles are exactly the same, whether you're on a Hermley budget, whether you're on a Haas budget, whatever it might be, you can standardize, you can build your process, and that is going to be um, the key to it. Yeah, no, I, I think so. That's that's so key for, um, you know, for any business, basically. Yeah. Um, 
Well, <laughs> Robert, this has been such a great lesson. Uh, thank you for, for everything that you shared. I know tons yeah, of people thanks. are going to get tons of takeaways. Appreciate well, you, you know, it's just sharing my so story. freely. But uh, yep. no, I certainly, certainly appreciate you having me on, Paul. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure I'll see you around at a, an NTMA event or something. And uh, yeah, yeah, thanks again for everything. This has been super fun. You're welcome. Thanks. All right.